Lord, our rock and our redeemer, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts here today be pleasing to you. Amen. Uh, I saw a, a story recently in The Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, if you don't get their publications, you should. They're a wonderful organization. And the story was about a Christian widow in the Middle East. Uh, her husband had been killed for smuggling Bibles into a village in the Middle East. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine all of the feelings and reactions that that widow must have had at the loss of her husband. Uh, she must have gone through grief and deep anger, um, but also, I think, speaking for her, great pride in her husband's sacrifice and what he had done. How did she decide, finally, after all the feelings, to avenge her husband. Do you know what she did? She continued his work. And not only did she continue bringing Bibles into that village in the Middle East, she distributed, with the help of her parents, 1,500 New Testaments in the same village. Now, friends, that kind of reaction doesn't come naturally to people. That kind of reaction is born out of the grace of God and the mercy of the Savior. And when I heard that story, I immediately thought of the apostles. How far they had come. How far they had come from the crucifixion of Jesus and their response in Acts 5. Now today we're going to be a series called um, Easter Tide and Acts. Easter Tide and Acts. And we want to connect the hope of the resurrection, uh, the mission of the church, and our church together. We want to connect our mission in Hagerstown, our mission now in Frederick and Chambersburg, which we've been prayerfully working towards for uh, many years now in Frederick, but a couple years at least in Chambersburg. We want to connect all this together as we read through Acts. So we're going to be in Acts for the entirety of Eastertide. And by the way, our Anglican heritage... Actually, if, you, if you're wondering why we're beginning in Acts 5 this morning, it's because if you're a good Anglican, uh, don't raise your hand if you've been doing this, but if you're a good Anglican, you should have already read up to Acts 5. Now, because the church gives us an entire week of readings to celebrate the resurrection and read through, um, read through Acts. Because Eastertide is a time for mission. And so that's what we want to look at um, uh, this morning as we begin. So again, page 913, if you want to, uh, as you want, if you want to follow along. As we move into our passage today, the apostles are in hot water for the second time with the Sanhedrin. They've already been before the Sanhedrin one time, the Jewish leadership in Jerusalem. Uh, Pentecost has already gloriously happened by this time. The Spirit has been poured out on the church forever. Uh, the apostles are changed men because of the resurrection of Jesus. And they're now leading not a, a disbanded group of followers, but a living church full of gospel joy and power. Now, the lessons for mission today are many, but I want to distill them down to, uh, to four lessons to us this morning, four takeaways from our passage. Let's dive right into it. The first takeaway is this. God backs up the gospel message always. There is never an instance where the gospel is not backed up by God. Read verses 18 to 20 with me. Verses 18 to 20 say, But that night an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And they go and they do it. Now, we know that God does not always deliver from imprisonment, from persecution, or death. He doesn't always do that. The apostles, what? They all die as martyrs, right? Like with the exception of John. They're all going to die as martyrs. They're all going to follow Jesus to the cross in that way. All of them, with the exception of John, will do that. 
But this passage is in the scriptures so that we would know that God stands behind the proclamation of the gospel. God himself, God Almighty. And what does that mean for our responsibility as his people? Are we called to work up our own power? Or our our own ability to make people receive the gospel? No. Our responsibility is to be faithful to where the power lies. The power lies in the message itself. It is the good news itself that gives people the eyes to see and the hands of faith to believe. What did St. Paul say about the message of the gospel in Romans 10, 17? Here's what he said. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the what? The word of Christ. That is to say, the message about Christ, the message of Christ, the message empowered by Christ. What was the angel's charge to the apostles as they were delivered from prison? It's so straightforward that you can almost miss it. Verse 20, speak to the people all the words of this life. I actually like the NIV here. The full message of this new life. In other words, just go and tell. Go and tell people what Jesus has done and what happens. The church grows exponentially because of that message and the power that's in it. Later in Acts 5, if you want to flip over a page... The Pharisee uh, Gamaliel will give this advice. Verses 38 to 39. Gamaliel says to the council, So in the present case I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. 2,000 later... 2,000 years later, we know Gamaliel spoke so much better than he knew. John Stott says here that the apostles were called to be not only eyewitnesses of what they had seen, but you know what else? Mouth witnesses. That's what they were called to do. To be faithful to what they had seen. To the power of the message they held. They were simply to be faithful to to speak. Now, let me bring it back. For those of us who are laboring to plant a church, we're still to plant a church in Hagerstown, right? Like that work hasn't ended. For those who are laboring to build a church in Chambersburg, the Sipes are away this week. They'll be back next week. For David and Sally and their group who are laboring to see a work started in Frederick, you know what the most comforting, the best news that I can give you this morning is It's not your work. Sure, you're called to be faithful. Yes, you're called to show up. Yes, you're called to speak. That's what God asks of us, and that's a great thing. All that you need to do is open your mouth and be faithful. That's it. You you cannot drive belief into people's hearts. God does that. God opens the heart, and you know that why. Because he did that for you. He opened your heart to believe and to receive the truth of the gospel. So again, the first takeaway, God backs up the gospel message, and he does that always. Here's the next lesson, though, the next takeaway. and uh, Let's stay in verses 19 to 20. This takeaway is a little bit longer, so hang, hang with me. God reversed the judgment against Jesus for the purpose of forgiveness. That is to say, the judgment rendered against him in his death was reversed for what? The purpose of forgiveness. Jesus' cross becomes what? Not just an instrument of torture, but the the sign of life, right? It's now the means of salvation. So God reversed the judgment on Jesus for the purpose of, of forgiveness. And here, God reverses the judgment on his people for the same purpose. Let me read again, verses 19 to 20. So the apostles are in prison. It doesn't look good. But the judgment of heaven is that they have to go free. You see that? During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go, you guys are free. Judgment reversed. Go and speak. 
So the judgment on Jesus was reversed, reversed, and the judgment on his people is reversed. In Acts, as the church grows, even in the midst of victory and growth, wild victory and growth by our standards, 